Okay. Um, I know some of you have sat through this before. Tell me what I should start. Oh, you're good. Go ahead. Okay. We're on. Okay. Well, I'm going to ignore that thing. Uh, as you probably know by now, I'm Greg Frick, and I'm from Inland Empire Drive Line Service in Ontario, California. And uh, I'm talk about uh, drive shafts and uh, theories behind what's going on under the car. And that'll take uh, 10, 15 minutes, whatever it is, we'll finally know at the end. And uh, then it's questions time. And the whole value of this presentation is your questions. Because we all get to learn from each other that way. And if, if there are no questions, I can go back here to this page one and I can start over. <laughs> 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 oh, we're going to troubleshoot some powertrain stuff here. Uh, drive shafts do four things for a living they transfer power from the transmission to the rear end, they accommodate length changes between the transmission and the rear end. Uh, they deal with misalignment of components and uh, they rotate around their own center line. That's pretty much the, the easy part. Uh, that's what they're doing. Vibrations come in four different flavors. There are transverse vibrations, inertial vibrations, torsional and harmonic vibrations. The Transverse is the one that everybody thinks about. That's the uh, unbalanced issue. The way that that is dealt with in the drive shaft business, you've got to build the shaft around its own center line. Uh, it has to have its mass equally distributed around that center line. And it then has to be dynamic balanced to correct for any inaccuracies in the parts. It does nothing, balancing does nothing but but uh, correct for one ear being heavier than the other. To give you an idea of what is involved with this balancing thing, this is a uh, Shelby Mustang we happen to use. And a one ounce weight, which is this guy here, pass them around, it's all seen tire weights before. If you're running down the highway in one of those Mustangs at 43 miles an hour, you're turning the engine at uh, 2,000 RPM, and that with 373 gears gives you 536 RPM, and the wheel at that low mini weight is kicking a three pounds worth of centrifugal force. Meanwhile, on the drive shaft, this is a one ounce drive shaft weight. And uh, as you can see, it's kind of a lot of weight to put on the drive shaft. It's running engine speed. So at 2,000 RPM going down the highway at the same 43 miles an hour, that thing is 10 and a half pounds worth of correction. You speed the car up to 64 miles per hour, it becomes 23 and three quarters pounds worth of weight flying around on that drive shaft. So the point is that even though it's closer to the center of the shaft than it is to the center of the wheel, it generates a whole lot more force for the same road speed. What's going on here? Uh, what's going on is that centrifugal force is increased by the square of the RPM. So 500 times 500 gives you a much smaller number than 3,000 times 3,000. So the guy that tells you at your local shop that, oh, I build them straight, I don't, you don't have to balance my shafts, doesn't know what he is talking about. But he also didn't spend the uh, 30 grand for the balancing machine. So again, it, it, it only corrects for mass distribution in the parts. It'll do nothing for lousy geometry on the shaft. The uh, inertial vibration has to do with the uh, U-joint angles. If all these components were on the same center line, nobody would be sitting here because there is no, no forces being generated. 
the minute the power goes through a universal joint, the shaft starts to speed up and slow down. So if you picture this is the nice smooth round power coming out of the transmission, it hits that front U joint, and now all of a sudden this round plate looks like it is oval. So for the U joint to get around this thing, it's speeding up and slowing down twice per revolution. Equal opposite joint angle at the back end takes this pulsating power out of that drive shaft, corrects it, and feeds smooth power into the differential. If you fail to make this correction for whatever reason, and you get this speed up, slow down, speed up, slow down stuff, equal opposite, they completely cancel each other out and the problem goes away. If you've got some angle left over in one of those joints, you've got some uncanceled angle. That's what breaks axle shafts. That's what wears out ringing pinions. Uh, that's what makes your mirrors go like this. Um, so it, uh, the angle thing is the majority of the problem that you're here to hear about. The thing to remember about this is it comes get them canceling, but no matter how perfect a job you do, that drive shaft is pulsating twice per revolution all the time. And that pulsation is the cause of everything else we're gonna talk about in here. And by the way, this is going on, or it's canceled, but you've got joint angle back there. The biggest single source of vibration in cars are the U-bolts. Everybody, Tighten some that Boy, this isn't going to fall off of my car, you know, pull it till a thread squeal. <laughs> but what you want is 14 to 17 foot pounds on these nuts, so back the nuts off, come down on the lock washer till the lock washer just flattens out, give it an eighth of a turn, and wow, leave it alone. That's all you need back there. Uh, most high speed, or this guy talked to me this just before I came in here. Got a vibration between 70 and 80, the only place where it is real high frequency. It's putting the U-joint bearing caps in a vise, and it'll move, but it's not gonna like it. Oh, you can fix most of these things for free. The, uh, I always manage to get lost about here. <coughs> The uh, torsional vibrations get to be a little fancier. A V8 is going to fire four times per crankshaft revolution. V6 fires three times. If you have a direct drive transmission, you got no worries. You know you're running down the road at 2100 RPM, whatever it is. These things are happening so fast that you're not lugging the engine. Life is good. Now you had an overdrive, and so suppose you got four firings and a 30% overdrive. Now all of a sudden, that pulsation from the crankshaft is happening 2.8 times per rev, not four. Same thing with a V6 or a six, that's two. But remember, the drive shaft, Mr. Drive Shaft, is already goofy at two per rev. So now, these things are starting to feed more pulsation into an already unstable part. About 94, somewhere in there, Fuller Transmissions discovered that they, there is a, a secondary torque spike at half the number of firing impulses. Nobody knew about this before. So, well, <clears throat> they found this spike to be most pronounced between one and a half and two per rev. Here's Mr. Drive Shaft, you know, getting, not only is he getting the fire you know, pulse bother him, he's getting this one and half the number of cylinders. So there's all this activity being forced into this drive shaft, which is already kind of 
not stable. The uh, harmonic vibration thing. And here's where the old element memorates that comes in. Uh, if you don't remember that, uh, she sings this and holds it this wine glass and glass blows up. And the reason that happens is that is a natural frequency. And she's singing this note that matches that. And the energy builds up in the glass. It's got no place to go and bang, it explodes. Drive shafts have natural frequencies too, so do tape. Uh, normally it's not a big deal, but in drive shafts, you can go by the booth and go bang, bang, bang on all those different materials. And they sound different. And where you get into trouble with, with harmonics is the shaft is already unstable. It's got a natural frequency. Under the right conditions, all these things come together and the drive shaft essentially does that, rings. And so, oh, I like this, and it starts to vibrate. What in the world is going on here? There is, in the drive shaft world, uh, and anything that rotates, a thing called critical speed. And critical speed is the theory you're out of outer space and you got this beam rotating and it's, it's dependent on diameter, length, and speed. So the theory comes down to Earth where we got gravity, we've got mounts for engines and transmissions, we got all this other stuff going on in this drive shaft already. The, at critical speed, the drive shaft will explode, just like that wine glass. And it's a very characteristic failure, it goes, it, it's right in the middle of the shaft, and it ends up looking like Elmer Fudd's shotgun, you know, all bent outwards. And of course, then it gets loose and all sorts of stuff starts happening. Um, it is our job to, as dry shampoos, to keep you away from that. That's why we say, oh, I didn't get much longer than 62 inches, it's two piece time. And that's to keep those shaft sections down, keep the critical speed way up where you don't go, and the whole business is nice and safe. There is also, because of all this two per rev instability I was talking about, at one half of, cal of the calculated critical speed, the shaft is going to think it's critical. So suppose it's 5,000 RPM this guy's going to blow up at. At 2,500 RPM, it's, it's disturbed because of two per rev issues and it, it shudders. And it's typically a, you know, like a mile or two mile per hour range that this happens in. And it will drive you nuts trying to find the source of it. Because you won't find it because it's, it's physics at work. So if you find that you have that sort of thing going on, uh, there are a few ways to approach it. We've got this little troubleshooting guide, 14 ways to avoid calling us a ball. Uh, and, and getting rid of a critical speed issue is you go bigger in the tube, you go with the center support, uh, you can use carbon fiber, it's got no resonance issues at all, and uh, it can all be dealt with. But practically, you know, it, it just gets more and more expensive. The long and short of it is that you guys have all built a car from the street up, and there are very, very few engineers anymore that have done that. Uh, they're all specialists. The specialists, fastest growing specialty is noise and vibration and harshness. Um, and it's all based on this kind of stuff. So I hope that this little short run through of this gives you the idea that there is more going on under there than you would think. Uh, 
the car is a blend of its components and they are all talking to each other and a lot of these issues that you run into with, with rattles and clatters and hairs going nuts uh, can be dealt with with common sense and a little bit of knowledge and they don't respond at all to throwing money on wheels and tires so you know before you go out and spend a whole bundle of dough chasing some sort of vibration on your your car pick up one of those blue things that are both and start at the beginning because whatever the answer to your problem is it is going to be the most basic simple boneheaded thing it could be it does not have to be sophisticated to drive you crazy so that's the background music, and I hope somebody's got a question where we can apply all this stuff. Oh, really? Your car's doing that to you? Yes, sir. <laughs> um, if it, you can the vibration, say, like 70 or something, mm -hmm. but if you back off, like, say, going down a hill, mm -hmm. you get a kind of a stronger one. Your best friend. For understanding angles. All of the stuff you're going to hear about angles comes off of some kind of racetrack. And what nobody ever does, and you should do before building a car, is think to yourself, what am I going to do with this thing when I'm done with it? If you're going to haul it to the racetrack on a trailer and go a quarter of a mile and pull a chute and put it back on the trailer and go home, you set it up one mile. If you're running in circles, you set it up a different way. If you're gonna drive it from here to Los Angeles, you set it up for the street. And everything that you can get from me is assuming that you're gonna drive this thing on the street. So, engines sit in frames at three degrees down. It is a world standard. Doesn't matter what kind of vehicle, except the street pod where we don't get to work. You know? So we zoom three degrees down. Here's the drive shaft, here's the rear end. If you run the pinion angle at as parallel to the crankshaft, you're gonna have this thing going up three degrees. And the goal is to have the suspension working equally on both sides perfect. So I'm getting to your question here, believe it or not. If you stand on the gas and the rear end rocks upwards and it's nice and smooth and everything's lovely until you start going down a hill with the engine braking then the pinion's going to dive because that engine and the, the inertia of the car can shove that down farther than the motor can lift it up. What that should, is telling you is that you got to reset the pinion angle a little higher so that it will work both sides are perfect. And my favorite line in all the engineering books I've got on this is in the Rockwell layout book way in the back. It's about this thick. It's got all kinds of creep letters and you know diagrams and stuff. And buried in this disclaimer at the end, it says the foregoing is all theoretical and the engineer will have to rely on trial and experience to see what works in any individual case. So you can set it up the way I'm telling you. It doesn't mean it's going to work. It does most of the time. But all suspensions are different. You know, you got a hundred of the same car. There are going to be a hundred different ways it behaves. So when you're running into what you're describing, rock the pinion up, go a degree at a time and see what happens. But before you do that, do number one on that blue troubleshooting thing and loosen those U-bolts up. Because it, and it re <laughs> just, yeah, re-torque them and torque them is, to get it to the correct torque is flat lock washer plus an A. 80% of the time that's gonna cure what you're describing. It'll still be there, it won't bother you. And the point of all this stuff is it's always there. It's never gonna go away. The trick is to put it someplace where you don't go. You know, who cares what it does at 200 miles an hour if you don't drive 200 miles an hour? Yes, sir? Does it make any difference if the motor, the front of the motor had been lowered down? 
so that the transmission is pointing up? Well, it's the rear mount. The rear mount is the same one, but when we put the new motor in there, he took the it's a crown big nose. Okay. And anyway, he took those mount motor mounts and shaved them off, and then well with the cap on them, and then built these motor mounts. But the motor sits almost level, and now yes. he shakes like you wouldn't believe. These, this information here, uh, we're all used to looking at things in, in the side view. Uh, but ultimately, the, the driving, the driven, and the, the drive shaft don't care where they are. They can be standing on end like they are in a cooling tower. And all the arithmetic works the same way. So if you know, if the motor is level and you come out of the transmission and the shaft is level and run straight into the pinion with zero angle back there, be happy. Now you're going to hear, all oh, that's going to cause the U joints to wear out prematurely, and it will. Design life on the joints is like 100,000 hours. So suppose you really screw this thing up and it cuts it in half. 50,000 hours is a long time behind the wheel of a street driver. So if you're really looking for ultimate smoothness, get rid of those joint angles altogether and sacrifice the joints. That's what they're doing on two-piece shafts in, in uh, Ford cutaways that they build Class C motorhomes out of. Front shaft is an extension of the crank shaft. There is no angle at the transmission. They take all of their angles at the rear end, and the reason they're doing that is to move that pulsating power as far away from that fragile AOB as they can get. It works great. Okay, another question is when uh, they built the drive shaft, mm -hmm. uh, I was there and watched them assemble it, and this, they put a young kid on it, and he used a, a press thing, but the, the cap didn't go in all the way. And I was thinking at the time, I said, you better take that part and put that bearing back in. I think the bearing fell over. So he pulls it out of the vise, he lays it on an anvil, and hits it with a great big hammer till it would, but it was still stiff. You couldn't hardly get it to work. Yeah, you can't hardly so pop that thing down like hard it. enough to get that bearing flat. Yeah, no, and I think I got a feeling I got to take that out and change the huge joints. Yeah, you don't want the bearings laying down on the end of the track. Yeah. <laughs> You know, but that's that's what I think. It's I, virtually impossible to get the snap ring. You know, well, he beat her till she Lord knows I picked up enough of those things off the floor. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's hammers. Bigger hammers are generally not the answer. Okay, makes you feel good. But, yeah. but it, 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 it's I think the vibration is getting worse. You know, you can you can stomp on it. Everything's good. But just trying to drive it nice and normal. Even like if I drive around the thing around here and you still want to do this. You know? Yeah, that's kind of the, the, the heck of it with, with these issues is the drive shafts really are fairly forgiving. You can treat them real bad and they don't bother you. And by the time you find out that, you know, I've got five degrees worth of angle at the transmission, now I got a puddle underneath the car, what's going on here? Something has worn enough to where pieces can start moving. And once they start moving, you're gonna know all about it. So it's it's there's there's so much lore out there, street smarts on this particular subject. And people get it, they are argue with themselves about it. And the, the, the reason is that all of it comes off of some kind of track. And nobody, there's, there's no place to go to get a simple run through about what is it supposed to look like? You know, one that drove us nuts for years is how do you tell if the shaft is the right length? You know, they're looking at the slip yoke up here, and boy, there's a lot of ground surface hanging out of that transmission. I can't be right. I wonder what's right. Well, the way, the way you check that is not up there. You go to the rear end, take the U-joint loose, because you're going to fix those U-bolts, and shove the shaft all the way forward, and it should come out of that pinion yoke and drop cleanly away without you having some kind of tool in your hand. And you can live with about 3 eighths of an inch gap between the back of the bearing and the shaft, 
and uh, the fear of the yoke. If you find you got an inch and a half gap back here, you just found your problem. And, and you can't look at the transmission end because transmissions lie. You know, a 350 Chevy can have an inch and a half worth of shaft sticking out of the tail housing and look stupid, but it's, it's as good as it can be. It can also have a half inch sticking out because the parts have been shoveled for 60 years now. Uh, and if then you have an inch and a half of ground surface sticking out, you got a problem, but you can't see through the slip yoke. So check it at the back end. It's real easy. And then don't over tighten those u bolts. Yes, sir. What's the recommended degree for the motor? Three. Three, and then one rear end. Three. Same. Three down, three up. Now, again, this started out as something besides the straw. But, uh, <clears throat> by the way, all of this information is in this, and I got a whole bunch of them, so if you want one, you can carry it off. Assuming three down on the motor, three up on the pinion, level drive shaft. Got three degrees here, three degrees here, you're all done. If the shaft is going downhill to the rear end, see how flat those angles get? Yeah, they just start going away fast. It gets smoother and smoother and smoother. But if you've got a TKO Tremec and you've got the rear end way up inside the body and the shaft is going uphill to the rear end, those angles get big fast and out here in trouble. Does anything, Spicer says that five degrees, their parts will live the design life of 100,000 pounds. Street runners are generally fairly sensitive flowers and they will notice five degrees. And part of the reason I preach three through the joint is nobody's ever complained about three through the joint. I've had them complain about five. So don't go to five. Parts will be happy, but you won't. Uh, when you're faced with this kind of a situation, you can do that. Crank the pinion down. You got three here. This has the effect of leveling the shaft. You got three here. And all of this inertial stuff goes away as it gets canceled. Dude, why don't they do that all the time? There is a thing called the secondary couple loads, which is a phenomenon similar to a virus. I don't know what else to call it. But it operates at 90 degrees to the component. So it's trying to go that way while the shaft is doing this. When you do equal opposite angles, secondary couple loads cancel each other out. When you do this, they are added to. And the heck of it is, there is no guideline, no formula, no street smarts, nothing to refer to, to see how far apart do these two U-joints have to be before they don't talk to each other. And so you go to the Rockwell book and you look up this line and says the engineer has to rely on trial and experience. Welcome aboard. <laughs> but you can do this. You know, if you think about it a while, you're, you're going to get rid of the inertial problem, but uh, you still have the, the pulsating power and you still have the secondary couple loads. And at some point, I know for sure this, this is never going to work in a Cobra. It's never going to work in a bucket T. It might work in 32 Roadster. It will work in a 53 Studebaker. We've done several times. It works every time. But those shafts are real long. So, and, and again, secondary couple loads are still there. And they're probably still talking to each other. But you don't know about it, and that's the goal. You, know, you want to chase this somewhere that you don't go, and it doesn't hurt the car, and then forget it. Yes, sir? So you're saying a car that's been slammed to the ground, and the motor is, it's a lot, is it the same level, or maybe it's a little bit lower than the, the rear end? You're saying point that pinion up? Instead Put it of down. down. Point it down. 
point the pinion down. Yeah, because the reason being, if you try to do the parallel line routine with three degrees on each end and the rear end is up here, the working angle through the joint, you got three down here, maybe you're going uphill at three, now you got six here, you're gonna know all about that driving it down the road. So if it does that, when you park it and let the air out, it sits on the ground, who cares? It's not moving. Right. And if you blow it up and it does something else, it, who cares? You're not going very fast. So set it up for smoothness at whatever height you're gonna drive it down the road. Now, I'm convinced, I've been convinced for 20 years that not every car that arrives at a show like this in the trailer is in there because it's so blue and precious. Some of them won't go over 40 miles an hour because of what we're talking about. But boy, they're stopping. <laughs> yes, sir. You know, I understand the front end of this thing, you said uh, you're leaving us to think of a bigger diameter would be more desirable? Or the tubing, this tubing here, you can figure round numbers, three inch diameter tube, you're okay out to about 52 between joint centers. Three and a half, 56, 58, depending on the, how much power you got and what you're doing with the car. You get past about 62 on a four inch diameter tube, it's two piece time. And while that scares a lot of people, and when we built our, we got a 40 Lincoln, and it had a 120 inch wheelbase, so I knew it was going to be two pieces going in, so I didn't think about it. But we went to install it, and lo and behold, three inch tube fits inside the old torque tube pump. So we didn't have to modify the floor or do anything crazy to accommodate a great big diameter drive shaft, you know, just, it turned out to be the simple, easy, less expensive way to, to do that car. And, and setting up a two-piece might take an extra five minutes thinking it through, and I try to picture and say, oh, do this. Uh, but the result is much more drivable and reliable and uh, smoother operating than trying to go with a five-inch diameter aluminum shaft out of the Silverado and putting it in a metropolitan. Yes, sir. With uh, changing materials to aluminum with uh, this mass, does that change basic sizes of drive shaft diameters it for does. these length categories? No, and it, it, it doesn't. Uh, because in order to get equal strength out of 6061 aluminum to 1026 steel, you gotta use twice as much of the aluminum. So there's a there's a mass difference. Yeah, that makes your AOD and your 700 R4 real pleased with you because you're taking care of it by getting rid of weight. But they behave exactly the same way when you figure critical speed. The difference bet between materials, those two behave the same way. And carbon fiber is completely different cat all altogether. If, if, if you bang on it, you know it, it goes clunk. Uh, it can be designed for specific torque loads and frequencies, and all kinds of stuff can go into the design of that carbon tube. And you can build one that is from me to Louis long, and it'll run fine because it is really, really stiff this way. But it can be designed with as much wrap up as it seems reasonable for whatever your application is. And like everything else, there are limits to that material despite what the rocket scientists tell you. If, if you consider this is the goal, we all know the goal and we can design for that, but what we didn't know 20 years ago and most people in carbon today don't know, it's where are the sidelines. And there are things you can do with carbon to achieve a goal, but this, you can't run outside the sidelines or it's gonna blow up on you. And they all blow up the same way. At 20% ahead of the pinion joint, they turn into a whisk broom over time. So, uh, 
I usually and bring this up on my own, and I, so I will, but I'm going to blame you. Uh, one of the, usually there's somebody that's got an eight inch board in the crowd, and uh, if there isn't, here's some more about eight inch boards to be aware of. And it's not all eight inch boards are nightmares, but all nightmares are eight inch boards. What's going on with this? When those things came out of Ford, at random in the production line, there is a cantilevered weight that's bolted to the axle tube and it hangs off the, the axle tube and it does this for a living. And it's ugly. So the first thing Street Rider does is unbolt that and throw out the barrel. Instant vibration. Why? Well, it took years to figure, find it out. And I'm relying on a guy that was in the, one of these seminars that told me afterwards, you want to know what's causing that? I sure do. The eight inch Ford is, is a, a nine inch design with less mass. Okay, so some frequencies that are going on inside that rear end get out of the eight inch Ford that don't come out of the nine inch with a greater mass. So, when they had a shaker coming out of the plant, they pulled this thing out. Well, okay, that's great. That's what happened. Why? Well, it turns out that the axle shafts and the 8-inch boards are real, real small diameter because they were originally designed for the Maverick or the, what the hell was the other wow. Falcon. You know, they were both of real prime pieces of equipment. So they didn't need the diameter axle shafts. They didn't have any power to begin with. And the heat treat didn't have to be all that swell either. And this fellow told me, who had said he worked at Ford, you can take an eight inch Ford axle shaft and drop it on the floor from belt height and it'll be enough to cause that vibration. So his question was, what do I do about this? It's the simplest thing in the world. I said, axles for motors you know, They make one size forging and it's big. So if you tangle with an eight inch board or you have a friend who is going crazy trying to chase down a vibration in an eight inch board, the first guy that cured one that I talked to, I talked to him for about three years, he ended up taking a piece of uh, Land Cruiser leaf spring he had laying around welded it to his axle tube, found an old hammer head or something, welded that to the, to the uh, Land Cruiser spring, and it would do this for a living. It's in Vegas. He took off down to 15 freeway from one way. I thought, wow, that's really amazing. So I called this friend of mine who's a professional engineer specializing in drive shafts, and I said, Mark, how how critical is it that this be exactly right to get rid of the, the problem? He said, well, in engineering, it is much, much better to be lucky than good. <laughs> <laughs> he said, your buddy in Vegas was just plain lucky. But the message is, all he was doing and all that the factory way is doing is changing the mass of the axle housing and giving that frequency a place to dissipate in the atmosphere. But the answer to it ultimately is, you know, after 50, 60 years worth they even being in a falcon, those axle shafts are starting to twist. And so any kind of any problem that's going on with an eight inch for change the axle shafts before you do anything else. If it doesn't do anything, you're out 275 bucks at most, you're so what? It's cheaper than buying new tires. Yes, sir. Maybe you touched on something while going on a motorhome, like on the three or four piece drive shaft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm the proud owner of a, it's not a motorhome, but it's a truck. We got Buku's the drive shaft. Yes. Now, tell me again what, what I need to do. It makes which which shaft needs to have the offset, and which can run parallel, and that and or, or uh, you ain't kin to that engineer that was in here last year. <laughs> 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 My bad. I don't he know. designed school buses, and we agreed oh, that you know yeah. four shafts is a, isn't too scary, but five is a nightmare. 
I think that it's, it's the three. same story. If you go back, I don't know if we can find good enough and flip the page, but it, it doesn't matter. What you want is if you call the top of the shaft plus and the bottom of the shaft minus, okay. and you check your starter motor and you say, yep, by golly, that thing's in there at three degrees down, and you go back and you check the pinion. Crank it around so you can stick an angle finder on the ear. Say, yep, by golly, that thing is three degrees up, or whatever it turns out to be. You want all of the angles in all of the shafts that come down plus and minus to add up to the zero. End of story. That's all there is to it. So if you've got shaft A is coming out of the transmission at zero at, at three degrees down, okay, you forget that. The next one will probably be a degree and a half down. And then there'll be something, it'll be, they'll be canceled by some other angles in the next shaft. The trouble is, this is so long, by the time you get it all added up to zero, the pinion end is dragging out of the ground. So, jack it up in the middle, and just play with them until you keep the angles down as, as flat as possible and they should add up to zero. And it'll be smoother slants. Okay. If you loosen up the nuts on you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got that. Can I leave that alone now? One more. Yes, sir. So actual, you're saying the actual dry shaft angle doesn't mean nothing as long as you've got the rear end and train. That's right. We're not talking about the angle of the dry shaft. We're right. talking about the difference. And now, the motor, like an old pickup thing. Mm -hmm. The motor was up higher, even though it wasn't. Yeah. Got three three, and the rear end lower. Are you still just one of the three degrees? Well, it's just, it's again, you know, your, yeah. your, your best friend here is the Swiss out of the uh, straw. Um, if the motor is way up here, angles go away. Problem is, if the motor is way down here, the angles get sharp in a hurry. And so, a source of big angles in the front end of street rods. I heard this from Vanderbilt and Fat Man in one of his presentations one time. People go buy a frame from somebody like Vanderbilt or TCI or whoever. You got to ask the manufacturer what rake do you have designed into this frame, and they'll all have some. So if you take it home and set it level on jack stands, every hole you drill, every well you make will be in the wrong place. So you stick the motor in at three degrees down with a level frame, put wheels on it, get it ready to run down the road. All of a sudden the motor's sitting there at six degrees down. How did that happen? Again, it's it's I think it's Occam's razor, it's called the theoretical philosophy term about essentially whatever the answer is is the simplest most bald-headed thing it could possibly be so when starting out make sure you know what you know the stance designed into the frame is and then set your jack stands up that way yes sir seems terrible well in mustang tubes oh and the casters just not good be it's not drivable that's why they have them trailer things yeah. Uh, so the starter mount is a is your go-to location. Starter motor itself, is yeah. Starter motor itself is good enough. You don't have to pull that out to get to a machine surface. But the motor is kind of long and it's parallel to the crank, and you won't find on a motor today uh, any machine surface that you can get at. So, and, and again, this is all kind of crept up on us when we were somewhat younger. It was normal for an engine to be running 21, 2300 RPM, wasn't on the highway. Well, none of this inertial stuff, torsional stuff, came into play at all, unless you forgot to put the clutch down pulling up to the stops. But now, in the interest of fuel mileage and everything else, the motors are run with computers and they're real efficient. And, you know, they're putting in overdrives and they got real long legs and it's all great, except that 
all of a sudden you're driving on the highway at 1300 RPM and a car shaking like crazy and nobody can figure out why. You're plugging the engine. So mostly, you know, what we talk about at the booth is somebody's got a done car and you know, it does this, you know, how are we gonna get rid of it? You know, we're short selling the car. Uh, and uh, figuring out how to deal with a dumb car and get it to where it's drivable and you don't need the trailer thing. Uh, that's, that's what's fun for us. And sometimes people ask, why, why do you tell people this stuff? And, well, because they spent 500 bucks to buy a drive shaft for me and this car's still doing the same thing. Now it's my problem. At this point, it's your problem. And if I can help you fix it for free, well, great. Why spend money on something you don't need? So, if you think of anything, we uh, are still here till one tomorrow, not here. But we're down in the other building. Uh, you know, there's Borgeson and Walker, and the class guy, and us on the wall. So, if you think of something, uh, uh, buy it. I should open. I got one thing. Yes, sir. Vehicle sitting on the ground. Mm -hmm. You take the uh, U-joint off, you should be able to move the drive shaft in three-eighths of an inch to yes. the train. Yeah. Okay. If it doesn't go three-eighths of an inch, but you can drop the shaft off without prying it off, you're okay. Okay. Because then, if you look at the wear on the slip yoke where the seal's been right, it doesn't go more than 16 of an inch. So, with the suspension cycle, there's very little. Very little, yeah, unless you're an off road racer or something. We had guys with 48 inches of wheel travel and then five eighths of an inch of the transmission. It's all about how much geometry they have. Because you are willing to sit through this thing, um, get a medal. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, give it to you. Let's do it this way. I'll pass these around. There you that way I don't drop them. <laughs> you are in charge of dialing in your own attitude. Yeah. And you use the handy signal to your wife when you walk in the door. Just one button. Uh, okay. I don't know this button today. Yeah. <laughs> well, it wasn't this way. Did you move it over? Wasn't it drunk? <laughs> You're all right, man. I don't care what you think about.